throughout all time, men have sought in drink release from tension, care, and from the pressure of reality. Over 50 million Americans drink more or less regularly with no visible bad effects. A few million react typically and recognizably to alcohol, but still remain strictly occasional drinkers, sometimes victims of a glass too much. But of grave concern to the United States is the growing number of those unlucky problem drinkers, the alcoholics, whose addiction is uncontrolled, compulsive, and in the end, destructive. Come on, Mac. Huh? Come on, time to go home. Just one more drink. No more drinks for you. Come on, on your way. Leave me alone. Where do you live, Mac? Take your hands off me. Oh, you're gonna get tough, are you? You'd better come with me. Listen, I can take care of myself. Yeah, that's what all you drunks say. Come on. Look, officer. I've got to get word to my wife. I've got to get out of here. Okay, okay, just calm down. That's right, Mrs. Lane. Walnut Street Station House. Ask for Sergeant Garrity. Right down. Thank you for calling, Sergeant. Bye. I told you this would happen. Carousing, irresponsible. Oh, Mother, stop it, please. There's not a better man on earth when he's sober. And how often is that? He's just a hopeless drunkard. What am I going to do? What can any of us do? That alcoholics are not evildoers whose misdemeanors may be dealt with by punishment, but rather people in the grip of a mysterious inner compulsion to drink, is a concept society has not fully grasped. Yet the world has known for centuries the toll of health, of families and of careers which drunkenness has taken. By precept, example and exhortation, generations of temperance crusaders have carried on their work. Notable among them was Father Matthew, an Irish priest, who nearly a century ago converted 700,000 disciples in America alone. Later came America's bone-dry reformers, luridly denouncing the curse of drink, whose efforts were to be crowned in 1919 by the enactment of prohibition. Despite national prohibition's failure, such organizations as the Woman's Christian Temperance Union have never stopped their efforts to outlaw liquor. And I'm happy to report that last year, 183 counties and 614 towns in this country voted themselves completely dry by outlawing all alcoholic liquor. Fearful that excessive drinking might lead to a return of prohibition, the U.S. liquor interests have made a determined campaign to promote moderation. By an appeal to tavern keepers, the Allied liquor industries are urging a curb on drunkenness at a major source. The first thing to remember in running a decent tavern is don't sell liquor to minors or to drunks. If a fellow's known to be a lush, see to it that he can't get a drink at your place. If there's a man standing up at the bar and you think maybe he's having too much to drink, there's just one rule to follow. When in doubt, don't sell them anything. We believe in moderation. So let's put it into practice. Meanwhile, in the academic world, many institutions are seeking a sound scientific approach to the problem of alcoholism. 
One of these is Yale University's School of Alcohol Studies, where Dr. Howard W. Haggard, nationally known physiologist, has been working for years in collaboration with Dr. E. M. Jelinek, famed biometrician. Through exact research and analysis, through physiological experimentation, they and their staff have been trying to find out how alcoholics get that way and what can be done about it. In the school's clinics, alcoholics, referred by social agencies or applying on their own initiative, may find help. The patient's treatment is in four phases. A trained interviewer first finds to be cured. Upon this, his chances largely depend. Then the facts of his case are determined, for the treatment varies with the patient's history. Next, a doctor checks to see whether he needs medical treatment. But his physical condition may have less bearing on the problem than his state of mind, and it is the job of the psychiatrist to guide him back to mental health. The fourth phase is an attempt to correct whatever conditions may be wrong at home through interviews with the patient's family. Though its clinical work is necessarily limited, the school exerts a wide influence through regular publication of its findings and through its summer sessions where picked community leaders from all over the country come to learn and go home to apply their knowledge. In our town, the alcoholics are in as bad shape when they come out of jail as when they go in. Uh, why is that? Well, that's because detention is not treatment. Sending the alcoholic to jail is based on a scientifically obsolete idea of punishing him, not of curing him. If a mother drinks while nursing, will the baby develop a taste for alcohol? If the mother were quite drunk, but still able to nurse, her milk might contain as much as two-tenths of one percent of alcohol. That's about as much alcohol as if you were to put 12 drops of vanilla extract in a glass of milk. The answer to the question is no. Are temperance workers correct in stressing that the use of alcohol leads to disease? Physical disease is the least important danger from the use of alcohol. The real danger is drunkenness. But from a New York headquarters, one of the most dramatic jobs in combating alcoholism is being done by the voluntary organization called Alcoholics Anonymous. AA offers help freely to any alcoholic anywhere who is willing to admit his own inability to help himself. And though not a religious organization, its 12-step program calls for belief in some power outside the individual. Direct contact with those for whom help is asked is made only by AA members, who themselves have gone the long road from alcoholism to sobriety. That may be all right for some people, but not for me. All that pious stuff. I can't go for it. I couldn't either at first. But believe it or not, Fred, it works. I was in a lot worse shape than you are when Alcoholics Anonymous got hold of me. Well, anyway, I'm not that badly off. All I need is a little shot now and then. I can stop any time I really want to. You can? Then why haven't you stopped? Because you can't and you know it. Fred, you're ruining your whole life. All right, all right. Maybe I have got to have the stuff. Yes, I've got to. I can't help it. So what? Okay. Once you admit that, then we can begin to help you. If you'll let us. Do you want to get well? Well, what would I have to do? If a new member of AA is in bad enough shape, he begins his treatment in the hospital, where he is built up by rest and vitamin therapy. During this process, old AA members, working in pairs, with the more experienced guiding the less experienced, give him constant encouragement. 
All through his ordeal, the new member finds strong support in the company of the others. Here is a social group of which he can feel a part. And whatever his problem, others show how they have conquered theirs. Ten years ago, the doctors all gave me up. Said liquor was killing me. Said I didn't have the courage to stop drinking. Well, I didn't. Until AA helped me get the courage. I've been dry for ten years now. Any of you can do as much if you want. Because you got 24,000 of us behind you. I began drinking after an illness. I lost my husband, my job, everything I had. Then I heard about AA. Well, I haven't had a drink since. Hope blossomed into faith. And the combination of hope and faith led to that eventual miracle which AA provides, sobriety. I don't know whether I'm happy because I don't drink or I don't drink because I'm happy. You figure it out. AA stands ready to help each and every one of you stop drinking. We did it. We'll help you do it. We'll close the meeting in the usual way. Our Father, what we have all be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us. As part of the therapy, the new member analyzes his personal failings and sets out conscientiously to remedy them. It is never an easy fight, and at times the craving for liquor can be overpowering. But at any time of day or night, another member stands ready to give him the help and sympathy he needs. Hello? This is Fred. Look, can you come over? I've got to go out and buy a drink. If I don't, I'm going to go crazy. I don't know how much longer I can hold off. Can you stick it out for a quarter of an hour? Ten or fifteen minutes, and I'll be there. Okay. I was just going out. Okay, fellow. Take it easy. Sit down now. I know what you're going through. It's the same thing I've been through a hundred times. Relax. Just relax. Remember the time I told you about when I was so bad that I couldn't sleep for two days?
Each victory over alcohol wins him added confidence, and he acquires additional moral strength by seeking out all those he has wronged and making amends. So I wanted you to know I'm sorry I tried to sock you. I acted like a heel. Oh, anyone's apt to take a drink too many. It's all right. Forget it. Of those who sincerely ask help, Alcoholics Anonymous claims 75% will recover, some immediately, some after several relapses, a rate of success far above that credited to any other method. But no true alcoholic is ever cured of his inability to handle liquor. As long as he lives, his only security is in never taking a drink. Listen, Fred, you've been on the wagon long enough. How about just one little quickie? No, thanks. You see, with me, it wouldn't be just one. You don't mind if I do, do you? Not a bit. But just give me plain ginger ale. The influence of Alcoholics Anonymous is spreading in the U.S., Great Britain, Canada, and Australia. Already, it has rehabilitated over 24,000 men and women, of whom many have become volunteers working to save others. Alcoholics Anonymous and other organizations combating alcoholism are gaining ground, bringing to the public a sense of the true nature of the problem through such spokesmen as the director of the National Committee for Education on Alcoholism, Mrs. Marty Mann. Alcoholism has too long been a taboo subject, just as tuberculosis used to be 40 years ago. We're trying to teach people the truth, that alcoholism is a disease, and that because it is a disease, it should have no stigma attached to it. Alcoholics should be dealt with like other sick persons, in hospitals and clinics, not in jails. Alcoholism, America's fourth greatest public health problem, can be solved by community action. The National Committee stands ready to help your community plan such action. Science has not yet fully explained the inner mechanisms of the problem drinker. But today it has been demonstrated through experience that the sympathy and understanding of one alcoholic can help reclaim another, and that in such brotherhood lies many an alcoholic's last, best hope. You think you're sunk. You think you're through. Well, you're not. You may not be able to help yourself, but there are plenty of us to help you, if you really want us to. Time marches on. Thank you.